Imagine that you have a time machine. You can go back 20, 30 years, and you can let Amazon know that not only can they take over the world of e-commerce, and yeah, they've done cloud computing too, but they start a payment option akin to PayPal. Well, in a nutshell, take that idea, apply it to Latin America, and what you get is Mercado Libre, a company that reported after the market closed. And this company has been on a great run, but Wall Street did not like what it saw during this quarter, sending shares down by as much as 10% in this video right here in this shot, about 9%. So what happened during the quarter and should investors be worried? We'll spend the next couple of minutes trying to figure that out. My name is Brian Stoffel. As of the time of this recording, this is actually my number one position. I want to give a shout out to finchat.io for sponsoring today's video. So this was Mercado Libre's third quarter of this year. Depending on where it opens, it'll be in the ballpark of a $97 billion, $100 billion company. Now, the company did have to restate some of its revenue numbers. There's nothing nefarious going on. It was just an accounting change that it did. So you might see different numbers in different uh, outlets. But on an apples to apples basis, revenue was up 35%, and that was ahead of analyst estimates. Now, on the bottom line, earnings per share grew 9% to $7.83. And that missed Wall Street's estimates by a very, very wide margin. That is a theme we're going to come back to over again, over and over again. Let's start right here. When we look at margins, it was ugly across the board. Gross margins contracting almost always. You got to investigate that because it is a surefire sign. It is a sign that will show up when a company is seeing its moat, its sustainable competitive advantage eroding. Now, that's not the only explanation, which is why you've got to dig further. But across the board, it wasn't pretty. Operating margins were basically cut in half. Net margins were down as well. But then we see something interesting. So yes, the company has a solid balance sheet with over $2.5 billion in cash. Sure, net income was up a little bit, although on 35% revenue growth, you'd love to see more. But look at this. Free cash flow grew way, way faster than net income did. How is that possible? Let's look. Now, it's worth pointing out that these numbers show the first nine months of 2023 versus the first nine months of 2024. But that being said, provision for doubtful accounts and funds payable to customers, those two things basically account for the difference in the growth between net income and free cash flow. Remember those two things, because I'm going to come back to them in just a minute. All right, now let's go to the income statement so we can see why everything was so ugly. So we see that revenue grew 35%, but the cost of that revenue grew 57%. That is not sustainable unless there's a plan, unless there's a, a wrinkle that we need to know about because gross profit only grew 16%. And if you think that was an insult, operating expenses, while gross profits only up 16%, operating expenses were up 44%. What happens then? Not only does your operating income not grow as fast as your revenue, it shrinks. It was down 29%. Now let's get into the explanation for why that was the case. Remember, I said this is part Amazon, part PayPal. On the Amazon side, the company, Mercado Libre, is building out fulfillment centers in Latin America. Specifically, it opened five in Brazil during the quarter and one in Mexico. There's no way these things can be fully operational right off the bat. That would be weird. It would be odd. Our whole universe would be mechanized if that was the case. And so that caused a significant drag on operating margins because of its drag that happened on gross margins. That is a moat widener. That is something where you have to make a big upfront investment and the company decides to expense this instead of capitalize it. So it shows up on the income statement, not on the free cash flow statement as capital expenditure. So that's a moat widener. So you get a pass, Mercado Libre, on that part. But here's the other part. The company decided to really ramp up its credit card business. Now, Mercado Pago, remember, this is the PayPal side of the business, in quotes. And the company had been giving uh, personal loans. Now, they, they get some money. Traditionally, Mercado Pago is the name of the product from payment processing and interchange fees. And then they started loan portfolios. So they had personal loans. And now they're offering credit cards. And they're really ramping up that credit card business. And like fulfillment centers, to ramp up that credit card business, there's a lot of up front costs involved, and it takes time to get the payback from that, which was the other major drag on margins. So that is why we see what we see 
when it comes to margins. It is also why all in all net income was down 11 was down to just 11% growth. The main reason they were able to eke out growth is because foreign currency losses were much less than they were in the year ago period. Now, one of the key things that you need to watch, and this is really, really key, is this weird word called NEMO. What the heck does NEMO mean? It's the net interest margin after losses. In other words, out of our whole loan portfolio, like what kind of profitability are we showing after accounting for money that we lent out that we don't think we're ever going to get back again? And if you look just at the numbers, this is bad news. This is bad, bad news. Look at for the la the the first nine months of last year, their NEMO was thirty five point one percent. That's good and healthy. They're lending out money. They're getting money back. That's great. They're making a profit, and that fell to twenty eight point three percent. It gets even uglier if you just look at the last three months. So the third quarter of last year, they had a NEMO of thirty seven point four percent. That dropped all the way to twenty four point two percent. What's going on? Are they making bad loans? Not exactly. In fact. Management would say that that's not what's happening at all. What's happening here is that personal loans and business loans, consumer loans, those are relatively high margin loans. And so when you have high margin loans, you're going to get a wider, a bigger NEMO. But now they're offering, they're, they're expanding their credit card to highly qualify, th th their credit card business in general is a much narrower margin business. And so you might say, well, why would they even do that? Because who cares? It adds to the pile of money that the company collects. If the margins contract, if the NEMO contracts, but the volume coming in for Mercado Pago grows to more than make up for that, who cares? That's the bull case when it comes to this. And that's why watching NEMO is important. You got to understand it's going to contract while they expand this credit card business. The key is making sure that it doesn't contract too much. Now, what else happened during this quarter for Mercado Libre? Let me tell you, out of all the companies I cover, this is the one that has the most moving pieces. And if I didn't have finchat.io, I wouldn't be able to keep track of all these moving pieces. You can use this by clicking the link in the show notes below, the first one right down there. And if you want full functionality, use that link and your full year membership will be 15% off. So let me show you what's going on here. So when I go here, I go down to this tab right here called segments and KPIs, and I'm going to show you a whole bunch of stuff. We're going to start with the e-commerce, the Amazon side of the business. So what this shows right here is how much money did Mercado Libre make from e-commerce services? That's like fulfillment and housing, warehousing products um, and shipping them out. And what we saw was the company saw revenue grow 45%. Now that's a step down from before, but this had been growing pretty well for a while. There might've been a little bit of a pause in advertising, which is worth watching, but overall, I don't think we can complain about 45% growth, especially when that 45% growth comes off of 47% growth in the prior year period. So, so the commerce, is is doing very well now it is also worth pointing out that mercado libre does sell some of their own first party products and actually here we saw some really good news we saw revenue grow 62 percent for those first party sales and so that's really good news as well all right so we've got the services that they offer for e-commerce we've got the products that they offer for e-commerce how about the total number of people that are visiting Mercado Libre's website in order to sign up? And we don't have a ton of data about the unique active buyers on a quarterly basis. It doesn't go back super far, but we there were 61 million unique active buyers going to Mercado Libre to buy stuff for themselves and their families. And that was up from about 50 million in the year ago period. In other words, the rate of acceleration, the rate of growth is actually accelerating. That's great news. More people are going to Mercado Libre's website to buy stuff. Now, as I said, there's just a whole bunch of stuff to show you. So this shows the total, the gross merchandise volume. That's the value of all the stuff that is sold 
on Mercado Libre's platform. That came in at about $13 billion. Now, there was a downtick right here, and we see that there was 14% growth year over year. There's a whole bunch of different moving pieces here, including foreign currency exchange, the fact that Argentina's economy has a big question mark after they're going through some kind of painful right-sizing, trying to dollarize their economy. Overall, this isn't like knock, knock your socks off number, but it's not a problem either. I'm gonna keep going down. The number of items sold. Now this is worth pointing out because the number of items sold, if you see that 28% actually grew much faster than gross merchandise volume. What does that mean? It means that people are buying less costly goods on this marketplace. Now you could say, well, that's a bad thing. I would argue that that's probably a good thing. The company introduced uh, two different products, uh, Merca Meli Essential, which is $2 a month, which lowers what you need to buy to get free shipping. Remember those fulfillment centers. And then Meli Plus, which does that, plus it gives you access to streaming video content. The bottom line is gross merchandise volume only up 14%, but the number of successful items sold is up 27%. It's becoming more of a habit for those living in Latin American countries to visit to visit this site to buy things. Now, I'm not even done yet because we also have the number of items shipped, okay? That grew 29%. So the number of items shipped up to 29%, the number of items sold is up 27%. Some of it is because there are virtual things that are being sold, but the bottom line here is that the fulfillment centers are being used. And that is a huge wide moat around Mercado Libre's business because no one, including in this region of the world, Amazon, is able to ship packages to your front door quicker than Mercado Libre can. So that's good news. And I promise I'm almost done, but this might be one of the most important numbers, which is the commerce revenue take rate. All this means is that with all the stuff trading hands on Mercado Libre's website, how much of each sale does the company get to keep? And if we see back here in December of 2019, they were keeping about 10 cents of every dollar changing hands on the e-commerce website. And now it's up to 24.3% because of all these things they're adding, like Mercado Envios, their shipping and logistics program, like advertising, things like that. This is very good news for the commerce platform. But oh man, I told you, there's a bunch of moving pieces. So now let's go to the payment side. So this is the amount of revenue that Mercado Libre has gotten from FinTech services. Now, what does that include? It includes things like payment processing, interchange fees, subscriptions that merchants might have. And growth here has been a little bit slower because they've, they've reached a lot of their customers here. And so what we see is revenue came in at about $1.25 billion. It was growing at about 11%, which is a slight downtick from where it was. There was some change in how these things are recognized, which accounts for this. But the real growth happened within the company's credit portfolio. Now, it's going to take time for the credit revenue to jump as much as the portfolio is. Because remember, they just ramped up that credit card portfolio. But this includes credit cards and loans. We see that that's about to bring in about a billion dollars per quarter. This grew 35%. It was a slight downtick from last year, but part of that again is because they were devoting a whole bunch of their resources towards the ramping up of this credit card program. If we look at the number of monthly active users on Mercado Pago, uh, it grew 34%. That might look like a significant slowdown, but that's just because we only have a couple quarters of data. The bottom line is this continues to march upward. There's a lot of people using it. What else can we look at? We can look right here, total payment volume, total payment volume. Um, and so what we see is there was about $51 billion changing hands in this quarter using Mercado Pago, which was up 34%. That looks very very healthy. If we look at the number of transactions, that was actually up 47%. So in much the same way that there was the growth in items bought on the e-commerce site grew faster than the gross merchandise volume because people were using it for smaller things like toothpaste. We see the same thing on the payment side. People are becoming habituated to using it. They're making more transactions, but at 
smaller amounts to buy that toothpaste, let's just say. And so that came in total transactions at about 3 billion just for the quarter up 48%. Now, the last thing we got to look at is really important and it is very similar to the one that we looked at for commerce, which is the FinTech take rate. Now, you saw with commerce, it was going up and to the right. And on this one, doesn't look as pretty. It's going down and to the right from 5% in the year ago quarter down to 4.3% now, which might be concerning. But again, it's worth noting, the ramp out of that credit card portfolio is going to do that. And moving from their basic Mercado Pago services revenue, which was relatively high margin, to loan portfolios, starting with personal loans, moving on to credit cards, it actually makes sense that this take rate won't be heading up into the right for a while, not until they've really captured all the market share they can. What you need to make sure is that the volume, the revenue growth in fintech more than makes up for it, which it should start doing once it is kind of fully ramped up its credit card portfolio. Wow, that is a lot of stuff that I just went through. So what else happened during the quarter? Well, management does not provide guidance. Analysts are expecting 38% top line growth. They, they were expecting $10.33 per share. Uh, I would not be surprised to see this revised downward. So what should investors watch moving forward? Well, number one, Nemo. Know that that net interest margin after loans is probably going to continue to trend closer to 20%. If it goes significantly underneath 20%, that require that would require some more due diligence second gross merchandise volume growth and the number of items purchased for the e-commerce side third revenue growth for fintech because remember that take rate's probably gonna not be heading up into the right for a little while so look at fintech mercado pago revenue growth and then look at the commerce take rate i don't know how much higher it can get it's already very high but we want to see it continue to trend as high as it can there is no doubt in my mind between fulfillment centers and making this Mercado Pago more sticky with the credit card rollout, the moat is definitely widening. The thesis is very much on track. Wall Street just does not like that they're, that Mercado Libre is going to have to forego profits now to collect even more later. Sometimes they don't like waiting, especially when they weren't expecting to wait. But long-term investors should absolutely love it. So what is Mercado Lib Libre's valuation look like right now. Before I get to that, I want to show you these are my results from December 31st, 2014 until today. Mine are in the green. The NASDAQ composites the yellow. The S&P 500 is the red. I show that to you because I launched a new service just two months ago called Stock Investing Mentor. It comes in three parts. The first, and I would argue the most important for long-term value, is one hour every week of live weekly sessions focused on one nugget each week. These are recorded. It has live Q&A where you can have your questions answered. Second, you get live real-time updates on my own portfolio. My number one position, again, being Mercado Libre, but if you want to see the others and get updates on any changes I make, you get that. And finally, 24-7 access to a private online investing community. Second link in the show notes below. If you want to become a member of this community, it's a 10% off coupon, but that is only good until Friday at 11.59 p.m. So don't forget to hit that. So what about the company's valuation? Well, you can head back to FinChat. And let me show you what we see. So what I have pulled up here first is the company's forward P.E. ratio based on what analysts think they're going to make moving forward. Now, it's at 50. Look, that's high for any company. It's high, but it's actually below over the last couple of years. It's average of about 53. I'm not sure that's the most useful metric that we can use. So let's look at forward price to free cash flow. That's at 41 times forward free cash flow. And that's actually above where it's been over the last couple of years at about 30. But again, I'm not sure that's the greatest way to measure this. What's another way that we could do it? Well, another way we could do it is a reverse discounted cash flow analysis. So if you put in the ticker symbol M E L I, and the company is trading for about 1950 right now. So this blue part right here, we're going to have to imagine it's 1950. The market's closed, so it's not updating. The company now has trailing free cash flow of $6.2 billion, $6.2 billion. So we're talking about a company that's 
trading for under 16 times trailing free cash flow. Now, remember, the big reason for that is because of those provisions, those provisions for bad debts. They, they, they provision that at the beginning. If they do a really, really great job, they can actually keep all that cash and all the extra cash that they have on hand because the Mercado Pago business is taking off. That's why the free cash flow, excuse me, is so much higher than the net income. So how fast does that free cash flow need to grow per year over the next 10 years to justify today's stock price? Well, remember, we're just looking for about 1950. So the fact of the matter is, it only needs to grow at about 5% per year over the next 10 years. That doesn't seem so bad. But let me throw a little wrinkle in there. And this is what that wrinkle is. It is that these free cash flow margins might actually be artificially high right now. Why? Because as the Mercado Pago business is expanding, that growth is all going to show up in a difference between free cash flow and net income. Once it kind of hits a steady state, then it's not that's not going to be the case. So let's let's just say the company levels out at 25% free cash flow margins. If it levels out at that, then today it would have about $4.8 billion in free cash flow. So if that's the case, now we're actually solving for how fast does revenue need to grow to justify this stock price. But again, the fact of the matter is, is it's not an insanely high number. It's it's below 9% below 9%. And now we're solving for how much revenue needs to grow. Well, how much are analysts expecting revenue to grow? Remember, if 9% is our bogey, well, it's expected to finish the year growing 39%, followed by 26, followed by 22, followed by 23. Well, I, I think now you can see why I'm so excited about this stock. So, that was probably the longest video I'm ever going to do on quarterly earnings, but there's so many moving pieces. Let me know what you thought of this in the comments section below. And don't forget to subscribe so that you can get the next 22-minute update when Mercado Libre reports in 90 days. Whew. Until then, Brian.